2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11, and it came to pass as they were, as they went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and uh, parted them both asunder and Elijah went up in a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof, and he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle <clears throat> of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And, and uh, when he also had smitten the waters and parted, uh, and parted thither and, and thither, and Elijah went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were at uh, were which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, "The spirit of Elijah to the rest upon Elisha." And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. All right, let's uh, pray. And Father, Lord, that uh, <clears throat> uh, same spirit that uh, we see on Elijah and Elisha is the same Holy Spirit, Lord, that's inside of me that. Uh, that uh, speaks to the churches, Lord, and that is alive today, and we thank you for that. We uh, pray tonight that uh, that same spirit would speak to our hearts and move among us. <clears throat> we pray that we would uh, not be normal, but in the supernatural. Lord, these are, uh, uh, these are the days of Elijah. These are uh, a different day we live in, Lord. We're in a different situation than they were in January. And uh, Father, we need you to move and uh, we think you've been doing that. We think you've shown yourself strong. We've been able to see great works. And Lord, we want to see more great works. And you could take your spirit off us at any time, and we deserve that. But we pray that you would continue to bless and do great works. I pray tonight that you'd be in this room and speaking to us and giving us what we need. Each one of us, Lord, we might need encouragement. We might need rebuke. We might need a, a, a kick in the seat of the pants. We might need uh, someone to tell us uh, we're not doing right. We, we need you, Father, because you know the need of each person. One person's discouraged and needs encouragement. One person is, uh, is playing games and needs uh, woke up. And, and we pray that you do whatever is needed and uh, move in a mighty way. We, we ask for your help and ask you to speak now in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Elijah um, had a servant, Elisha, and uh, the mantle passes in this story from Elijah to Elisha, and uh, and uh, they had they had been together, but now uh, e Eli I wish they would have named him Joe and Fred, but they didn't. And uh, Elijah and Elisha, Elijah was doing miracles, and Elisha was watching, and and Elisha was uh, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, there and with him when he was taken when Elijah was taken up in a chariot into heaven, and the mantle fell on Elisha, and Elisha got the power of God. And uh, began his miraculous ministry. <clears throat> he asks a question. He's there. He's, he's on the other side of Jordan. And he's got to cross back over. And he has not done any miracles at this point. All he's done is follow along and be there. And there's all, by the way, there's a decent crowd of people following along. They had the school of prophets, at least 50 prophets, who followed along into some kind of little Bible college that went along with them. Um, but Elijah and Elisha were, were the closer ones. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and at that point, um, and, and the school of the prophets, we, we don't know exactly how often they were in their own spot watching or, uh, or in their own place or they're with them. But certainly in this case, they were watching the whole thing unfold. And, uh, and, and when he gets to the River Jordan after Elijah is uh, taken up to heaven, he goes to the Jordan and says those, uh, those famous words. And uh, he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? <clears throat> On the bank of the Jordan, verse 14, it says, he took the man of Elijah uh, that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. There was the Lord God of Elijah right there. And uh, right there parting and uh, the ocean and uh, and so we uh, we uh, we we see that immediately there is the Lord God of Elijah and we see right where he is 
And uh, it's an exciting, exciting time where you see God working in these things. And you see that. And he asks the question, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Is he still here? Is he still working? Is he still doing these things? Um, but we find the answer. It's right there upon him. It's right there with him. It's right there working in his midst. And uh, we see there is the Lord God of Elijah. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? He's right there upon him. Why? Because he never changes. Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. The Lord is never limited. Just because Elijah dies does not mean Elisha can't see mighty works because God did not die with Elijah uh, when Elisha was taken up into heaven. God is never different. God is never limited. God is never smaller. God is never weaker. God is never um, uh, 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 not able to do what he needs to do. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? He's where he always was. And now he's upon Elisha. And, uh, and, and so he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Elijah's gone now. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he throws the mantle down to see if God's still going to come through and if God's still working. And the Jordan parts. And he walks across Jordan and finds out, oh, God's just fine. God's just fine. God is never limited. His arm is never shortened that he cannot save. He never changes. I'm the Lord. I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God has always been looking for mighty things to do through people. The limiting has never been on God's side. The, the Bible says in, in, I believe it's Isaiah, ye have limited the Holy One of Israel. He says in Isaiah, or in, in Matthew 13, 58, it says, uh, Jesus was not able to do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. God is always the same. God is always all powerful. He can always work. Work, but the problem always is limited by us, by humans, and it's very, very common. We see in First Chronicles, in chapter 16, First Chronicles, we see how often we see in the Bible, according to your faith, be it unto you, because people limit God. God wants to work, but there's nobody who bothers to get God to work. He has to be invoked to be trusted, to let him flow, yet there's a lot of clogs in the pipe. First Kings 19, <clears throat> sorry, First Chronicles 19, uh, we said, uh, uh, second, uh, second Chronicles 16, let me take you to the right spot, so I got a lot of verses here and I'm looking at all of them. Second Chronicles 16, it says in verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. God's eyes are constantly roaming the earth saying, I'm looking for someone who trusts me. I'm looking for someone who believes in me. I'm looking for someone who's going to do something. I'm looking to, I want to show how strong I still am. I want to show my power. I just got to find someone who I can use. Someone whose heart is right toward me. Someone who will have faith. Someone who will let me flow. I'm looking, I'm looking. I really want to do something big. I want to do something great. And those whose hearts are perfect toward him, God shows himself strong. I love what Dio Moody said, the great evangelist. He said, the world has yet to see what God can do with one man who's totally yielded to him. I aim to be that man. And of course, D.O. Moody saw over a million people come to Christ and shook continents, not just nations for the cause of Christ. And, and, and because God can still do great things and he still wants to do great thing. And yet Elisha is asking, where is the Lord God of Elisha? And I oftentimes hear people say, where is God? And I'm saying, God's working, God's moving, God's there. Where are you? You're trying to get God to get involved when you're not doing what God said you need for him to get involved. You're expecting God to break all of his rules and all of his plans and the way he said things are done. And you want God to bow down to you and bless your mess and use you when you don't even try and put forth the effort or trust or do anything else. And then say, where is God? You separated yourselves from God. And then you say, where is God? Exactly where he said he would be when you live like that. Exactly. You can count. God is very steady. Okay? He's very steady. If I constantly think, why do you think I'm doing anything different? I don't do anything different. I'm the, I'm, I'm the most consistent. I, I'm boringly so. And people uh, sometimes act like, Pastor, you're different, when they've changed. And I laugh at them. Like, 
I wish I could change more. I'm stuck like this. And, uh, and, and, and I laugh. And then I think, how must God feel who cannot change? People say, God used to be there for me, but God's not there for me anymore. Uh, yes, God gives yeah, a big wind blew him way down the street. Now he can't get back to you. What do you think? Your sins have separated you from him, the Bible says. And you say, where's God? Where's God? <clears throat> the title of the message tonight is not, where is the Lord God of Elijah? It, the title of the message is, where are the Elijahs of the Lord God? Where are the Elijahs of the Lord God? <clears throat> we don't have Elijahs anymore. We don't have Elishas anymore. And yet, people want to see God moving like he did in the days of Elijah and Elisha. Where are the Elishas of the Lord God? The real question is, where are the Elishas of the Lord God? The world is ripe, waiting for the Lord to move. The, the world wants God. The world is finding. The world's foundations are all shook right now. Like, they haven't been in my lifetime. The world is shook right now. <clears throat> it was shook a month ago. It was shook two weeks ago. It's more shaken right now. Peace is gone. Prosperity is gone. Health is gone. Government security is gone. Jobs are gone. People's security, every little foundation, every, every sandy foundation they had in their life has been washed away by the storms. And now people are saying, I need God. Yeah. We've read the studies. Yeah. It's time to reap. It's time to do great things for God. It is the time right now. Yet, where are the Elijahs? Where are the Elishas of the Lord God ready to see God work? Where are they? God is able. God hasn't changed. The world is so ripe unto harvest. The Holy Spirit's as powerful as ever. Jesus can save just as much as he ever has. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It's still in the Bible. It's still in 1 John. It's not changed. God is still ready to move mightily. The problem is not on God's side. Where are the Elishas of the Lord God? <clears throat> Number one, where are the Elishas willing to leave everything? Let's go to 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings 19. Where are the Elishas willing to leave everything? <clears throat> 1 Kings 19. I don't argue with people, but I often get to a field and immediately begin be, to be told how hard this field is. Everybody's field is hard. Every mission field is hard. Everybody is so hard here. And wherever I go. It's so common for somebody, somebody to begin to tell me, oh, you know, it's really hard here. It's not like where you're from. It's not like for this other, you know, you understand, the, you know, just the devil works here. <clears throat> and they spend a whole bunch of time glorifying the devil and what he's done. Look, I don't go to a country thinking God can't do anything. <laughs> I've never done that a single time in 30 odd countries I've been in and in who knows how many mission trips I've been in never have I gone through and never have I gone and God not done something why would I waste the time why would I waste the money the resources and when when we when we can see God work anywhere God is waiting to reap a harvest God is waiting to do something big but we've got to get back to letting God work where are the Elishas willing to leave everything first Kings chapter 19 <clears throat> And uh, verse 19, so that he departed thence and found Elisha, Elijah find Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. By the way, must add some money because yoke of oxen are expensive. Remember, it's not, it's not 12 oxen, it's 12 yoke of oxen. That means you have a very big field to plow. You're, you're, you, you, you have 12 plows going at once and, and 24 oxen pulling, and you are a man with some field and with some equipment. You've got a, a bunch of expensive equipment there you're pulling with. <clears throat> and there he goes by him, and it says uh, they're plowing before him. And by the way, he was a man's man. He was plowing a 12 yoke of oxen. Go look at the side. Go, most of you will never see an oxen in person. They're huge. They're huge. <clears throat> Trying to control two of them is a chore. He's plowing a 12 yoke. <clears throat> it 
And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elisha and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and I will follow thee. And he said to him, uh, Go back again, for what have I to do with thee? What have I to do with thee? It's kind of like, yeah, whatever. <clears throat> if, you want, if you think that's more important, go ahead. Well, he doesn't know, but Elisha is serious. And Elisha goes back, says, Mom, Dad, bye. I'm going to go follow the prophet, and we're going to give a sacrifice to God. He takes his plows, and he burns them, and he kills all his oxen for a sacrifice. He left everything, and off he goes. You know, Christianity used to be a lot more about that, and, uh, and you understood that serving God would cost you something. Look, in the New Testament, if you got saved, you probably were going to lose your job also. You're probably going to be persecuted. You might lose your life. And so you didn't say, I'm a Christian. You didn't say that lightly. You're taking a statement against society, and you're willing to lose everything for that. Jesus says, look, if you're not willing to lose your father, mother, sister, brother, child, uh, job, career, anything for my name's sake, you're not worthy of me. Willing to leave anything. It says in, in Luke chapter 9, let me read this to you, in verse 62. <clears throat> Luke 9, verse 62, And Jesus saith, said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Where are the Elishas who can get to that point where they can slam down the mantle and part the, the river? They're the ones who've been willing to leave all and follow Christ. But when people are full of themselves and their lives and their dreams and their plans and they will not get rid of their plows and they're not willing to give up anything for God and they're so filled, how can they expect God to fill him? Science tells us this, uh, uh, two different pieces of matter cannot occupy the same space. And he was willing to leave all. And, and look, it, it's, it's something that we don't have much anymore. People are attached to their stuff, they're attached to their careers, they're attached to their degrees, they're attached to their house, they're attached to their possessions, they're attached to their friends, they're attached to their family, they're attached to their little securities in their life, their little things they hold on to that make them feel like they're safe and secure. Where, I want to tell you something, <laughs> have you not caught on yet? The only thing safe and secure is God. You think your job is your security, you think your friends are your security, you think your health is your security, it can all be taken away just like that. You better get some real security in Jesus Christ and your relationship with him. Where are the Elishas willing to leave everything? Number two, where are the Elishas who can serve? Who can serve? Second Kings chapter 3. So Elisha follows Elijah. <clears throat> Let me kind of give you the process. Elijah comes out of the mountains, finds Elisha. Elisha follows him. Elijah continues to go forward and do miracles. You know what Elisha does? We have no idea. It doesn't say a word about him. It gives us one clue. It says one thing. It describes, he, we know he did this. Okay? Here's a description of what it says that Elisha did during the time he was with Elijah. Okay? And this is the only description we have. It's chapter 3. In verse 11, Elijah's dead, and they're describing Elisha and trying to find him. In verse 11, but Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a, a, here a prophet of the Lord, that we may inquire of the Lord of him? And one of the king's, king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. That's all he's known for doing. He wasn't, okay, I'm 1A, you're 1B, I'll do the big miracle, you do the little miracle. Okay, it's my day, you, you, my miracle day, your miracle day. None of that. He was a servant, and when it was time to eat, or when Elijah's hands were dirty, Elijah carried the water jug and said, okay. And Elijah would rub his hands under the water, and Elisha would pour his hand, the water on Elijah's hands. That's all it says. That's the only thing we knew he did the entire time he was with Elisha. It doesn't mention him. It mentions him after Elijah's dead and said, yeah, there's a prophet here. He's the guy who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. 
I don't think that's a degree, is it? <laughs> I don't think that's like glorious. I don't think it's like, hey man, he's a guy who, 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 who uh, got him halfway back from the dead and Elijah finished it off. No. He poured water on his hands. He was a servant. <laughs> Goodness, this is so important that we get this. There's so many verses on this. That's the entire description. That's all we have him before 2 Kings 2 when he says, where's the Lord God of Elijah? And he parts the Jordan. The only thing we know is he washed Elijah's hand. Matthew 23, 11 talks about the greatest among you is going to be your servant. Jesus washed the disciples' feet at the end of his ministry. Not at the start of his ministry. At the end of his ministry, he's still washing the disciples' feet. We don't put out a lot of good pastors anymore into the ministry because we don't have a lot of good servants. They come out of Bible college wanting the title. They come out of Bible college. Look, I mean, the, the, I've talked about when I interviewed Bible college students to, to work on staff, and I finally threw up my hand and said, goodness, forget it. I'll hire a dog. And, uh, and, 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 and. I mean, what's my title? What's my description? What, what, do I have an office? Am I full time? <laughs> and when the answer wasn't what they wanted, no, I'm not interested. I only want full time. I need an office. I only want to be youth pastor. You know what the ministry description is? Whatever needs done. It's whatever needs done. Okay. That if you know how many things I do in a week that are not this, this is not what I'm usually doing. Okay? And, and, and a lot of it's not glorious. And you know what? If you're too good to serve and not be noticed and be underneath somebody, you're too good to be used by God. Because Eli Elisha all he did was pour water on the hands of Elijah. We don't have a lot of Elijah because we don't have servants. Why don't they notice me? Why doesn't anybody recognize me? Why don't they say I did a good job? Why don't they let me have the position? Why do I have to do the menial thing? How come nobody notices what I do? Because you're being tested to see if you can be trusted to be a servant and if God can put his spirit upon you. And can he be like Jesus who went around helping people and feeding people and serving people and washing feet. And if he's going to see if you're too good for that. And you want everybody to notice and everybody, and everybody to patch in the back and everybody to say, aren't you wonderful? Everybody say, you're so glad you're at your church. Look, do you know how bad I am at that? You ever notice I'm this ultra focused guy who doesn't hardly notice when somebody's standing next to me? I'm always on a mission. And, and, and I am not always going to say, oh, you poor thing, you were gone for, so we're so glad you're here. I don't, I'm not going to baby you. Love Jesus enough to come to church. Amen. You love Jesus enough? Let me teach you how to love Jesus enough. I don't have time to baby. I, I'm not a babysitter. I'm a man of God. I preach the word of God. I, I'm not... I, you got to decide you want to serve God. I can't make you serve God. I, if I could grab people and drag them, I would. It'd be fun. And, but I can't. Okay? And understand that you have got to learn to serve God because you love God. And serve people because you love people. And can I tell you, service for God is not as glorious as you think. Most of the stuff is unrecognized. Most of the stuff is scrubbing toilets and fixing problems and vacuuming the floor and talking to a drug addict who doesn't know where he is and feeding the person who won't say thank you. It's ministry. But we don't have servants anymore. Everybody wants their position. Will you put me on the website if I do that? No. <laughs> but but do, are you going to tell a church that I did that job? Probably not. I forget half the things you're supposed to do during a service. I'm certainly not going to remember to tell how wonderful you are. <laughs> My wife, after the service, honey, you forgot. I know, I forgot. I've... Look, it's, it's not about you. Get the Americanism out of you of uh, me, I, why, me, why, me, me, me. Look at me. Why don't you recognize me? Why don't you appreciate me? Why don't you thank me? Why, why, don't, why doesn't anybody know what I do? Why doesn't everybody, hey, I tried to do this to this person and they were mean to me back. Welcome to the ministry. 
<clears throat> you got to be a servant. You got to do diligently your job that nobody will ever see except for God. We're not raising servants in Bible colleges. We're raising people who want to be recognized. We're raising people who want to be the preacher who preaches the youth conference, preaches the pastor's conference, and, and, and has this great revival sermon. And not somebody who wants to go and say, hey, everybody left and the church is a mess. Somebody's got to sweep this up. Welcome to the ministry. But who's going to see me doing this? Nobody. Now what about God? Where are the Elishas who can serve? Where are the Elishas who don't care who gets a recognition? Who doesn't care who gets noticed? The people who just want to serve God. The people who see the needs of others and they need filled. Number three, where are the Elishas who have grit? Where are the Elishas who have grit? We're in trouble with this one. Second Kings chapter 2. Elijah and Elisha are traveling, and it says in verse uh, 3, <clears throat> and it says in verse 3, And the sons of the prophets that were in uh, Bethel came forth to Elisha and said to him, Knowest thou uh, that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. You know what he said? He says, I know he's going to die today. I know he's going away today. Hush. And, Eli and Elijah said to him, Eli Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So he came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou not the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered and said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said to him, Terry, I pray thee here. It's not repeating. Or it's, it's, we're not reading the same verses again. He's repeating the process. And Terry thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And the two went on. And the fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. That's where you usually find most people. They don't want to be the one who goes in the middle of it. They just want to watch and then take credit that they were there. And they viewed afar off. By the way, that's where Peter, the Bible says Peter followed afar off, and that's when he denied Christ. And Elijah took his mantle. Uh, let me go back. And the 50 men of the sons of Jordan stood at the view afar off, and they stood by Jordan. And Elijah took the mantle and wrapped it together uh, and smote the waters, and they were divided uh, hither and thither. And the two went over on dry ground. And it could came to pass as, as they, uh, uh, when they were gone over, uh, that Elijah said unto Elisha, And what shall I do before I be taken away from thee? Notice, if he wouldn't have said, I am not leaving you, he wouldn't have got that question. What do you want me to do for you? I want to give me a double portion of your spirit. <clears throat> Grit, determination. You need me there. I'm going to be with you up to the last minute. You're the man of God God put me with. I'm going to be there for you, and you're not going to stop me. I'm determined. Proverbs 24, 10, it says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength indeed was small. Determination. I will. I shall not be moved. How can God give his power to somebody who doesn't have grit, who can't stand up to kings and can't stand up to, to enemies and can't stand up to generals like Elisha's going to have to do and say, look, Naaman, you're going to go to the Jordan River. I want to go to my river. Okay, stay a leper. A man of God has got to have some grit to him. He can't be pushed around. He's got to be able to say, God said, you what said what? God, I got to go tell the king that? You know, the king cut my head off? All right, let's go. determination and grit. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. I'm going to have to go over the mountains. I'm going to have to be there and go to this thing. I get to sleep out in the caves for a while. I've got to be strong. You've got to do that. Grit, determination. And there's so many things about this. I'm going to go to the New Testament and show you how Paul had this. When Paul was warned about the danger he was in, he did not move him. He had determination for God. He would not be moved and stopped. He was a man. Acts chapter 20, 
in verse uh, 22. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit in Jerusalem, not knowing the things which shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me. Neither count my, my life dear unto myself, but I may finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the grace of God. He says, I, God's given this job. I know I'm going to jail. I know I'm going to be beaten. Doesn't move me at all. I'm going. Nothing's going to stop me. They warned him that you're going to be uh, put into jail over and over. And uh, Paul did not, was not moved at that. In chapter 21, in verse 13, he says, why are you bothering to tell me this isn't going to stop me? And he said, Paul answered and said, what mean ye to weep and break mine heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound only, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Jeremiah 12, 5 says, if you can't run with the footmen, how do you expect to run with the horses? Ephesians, Ephesians in chapter 6 says you need to be strong in the Lord. And the power of his might. you got to be strong. Hard times are coming. The devil's going to battle you. In verse 10, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, uh, withstand in the evil day, having an all to stand. Stand, therefore. Just keep standing, having your loins girded about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You expect to face demons and devils and think you can be weak and cowardly and, and, and whimper when the tough times come, when the devil says you can't do it, when the devil says you're not worth, worthy, when the devil says you, you're not going to make it, when the devil says here's some problems, here's some suffering, here's some enemies, here's some mocking, and you think you're going to make it when you're not determined, you don't have grit inside of you and determination, you're going to go through trials. Part of the deal. You're not going to have answers sometimes. You're going to have to go forward in faith. You're going to have to decide, you know what? I'm going across there with you, Eli uh, Elijah, because I'm not leaving you. You've not given me a blessing. I need the power of God upon me. I haven't got it yet. I'm going with you. Stay here. I'm not staying. You, you, need, you know what? Your master's taking me. Hush. I'm busy. I'm going with him. Because he had grit to him. And we're in a world of girly men. We mock masculinity and strength and determination. And, 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 and now a guy comes up and, and somebody says, you know what, you're a loser. And he says, <laughs> I'm not talking five-year-olds. I'm talking 25-year-olds. And the 25-year-old, she's able to stand up and say, that's fine. I'm good. All right. Anyway, I got to go to work today. Not, honey, call the boss. I can't go in today. Would you call them? I'm too upset to call. Oh, poor woman. <laughs> what happened to manhood and strength and determination? And how can the devil go to you and say, you know what? You're discouraged. You say, okay, I'm not going back to church. I'm going to sit here in my corner. I'm going to, uh, I can't read a Bible today. <laughs> it's tough. Be a man. Jesus endured hardness for you. He suffered on the cross willingly and you can't go through some discouraging days and some challenges and things you don't understand. How can you give up on Jesus that easily when you're going to take a little heat? Where are the Elishas of the Lord God? Elisha was determined. Determined. Even our pastors wear their skinny pants. No man wears skinny pants. And they're wimpy. And they're bowing to pressure of everybody. And somebody says, I don't like you preaching that. I don't care what you want me to preach. Not in the least. Not going to intimidate me. Not going to scare me. I'll pull the money. I don't, know how, I don't know how much you give anyway. I don't care. God will supply the needs. I'm not a man pleaser. I got one audience that please. That's God. Don't like it? Find another church. Grit from God. Determination. Not quitting. Next, where we're winning friends and influencing people. <laughs> where are the Elishas willing to leave everything? Where are the Elishas who can, who can serve? Where are the Elishas who have grit? Where are the Elishas who have zeal for God? Let's go back to uh, first, uh, Second Kings. 
back where we started. <clears throat> Goodness, you tell someone a solution nowadays, they say, but that's hard. Yeah. Yep. You got to rebuild a thing. But that's hard. Yeah, it's hard. I, I, I have not found a life that's not hard yet. If I find it, I'll write a book. But you know what I have to do? I have to depend upon God and work hard and suffer through it and endure hardness, a good soldier, and come out with victory. It's hard. <laughs> Everything's hard. Everything's, we're in a sin-cursed world. Where the Elisha's was, Eli, Elisha's was zeal for God. Second Kings and chapter 2. <clears throat> Even the preachers are cowardly nowadays. That's a terrible thing. Everybody's afraid of people and, and, and society and governments and laws and people and, 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 and danger and health. I can hardly get so many people to go with me on a dangerous mission trip anymore. Where Christians expected to be in danger. Second Kings chapter 2 <clears throat> and verse 9. And it came to pass... Uh, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I, uh, what, uh, what I, what I should do for thee uh, before I be, that I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou art, if thou shalt see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. Can I just tell you something right there? Elisha was told, if you see me when I disappear, you'll get a double portion of my spirit. If not, you don't get anything. The decision was already done. Elisha was going to see it. Okay? Because great people make decisions and are going to do them. Nowadays, somebody said, oh, what if it happens when I'm getting sleepy? Will you not leave until I'm ready? Just tell me. Because, you know, I want some pizza and I might go need to get pizza. I'm just telling you, I'm going to get pizza. I'll be back in 10 minutes and don't go anywhere. But no, Elisha said, okay, that's easy. I got it. You're not going anywhere without me. I will be there. Because I want the power of God. God's eyes are looking everywhere to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. Those who have a zeal for God. Psalm 69, 9, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. A zeal of God. A zeal of God. And Psalm uh, 119, it says in verse 139, it says this, it says, um, uh, my zeal hath consumed because of thine enemies have forgotten my, uh, uh, forgotten thy words. It says in Galatians 4.18, it is good to be zealously, always zealously affected in a good thing. The Bible says God wants us to be a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Titus 2.14, zeal is a good biblical characteristic. And by the way, people are zealous for something. They're zealous for their music. They're zealous for their politics. They're zealous for their sports team. They're zealous for their favorite product. They're zealous for their multi-level marketing. They're zealous for making money. They're zealous for um, their favorite hobby. They're zealous for fishing. They're zealous about guns. They're zealous about makeup. They're zealous about cell phones. They're zealous about something. The same guy says, man, I don't have much time for that God stuff. You know, I, love, I know about God and I know about church, but, you know, I was really busy. And then all of a sudden you find out he's got lots of time for his car. He's part of the Honda Club. He just bought $2,000 wheels. He polishes the thing all the time. He adjusts one little tiny screw, calls his buddies about it. Hey, man, check this out. <laughs> he has zeal. I can't believe people spend so much time and effort on things that are temporal. When eternal souls and eternal God and eternal things are sitting there and they don't have zeal for it. But ask him about the newest iPhone 26. <laughs> and they're going to tell, somebody's going to listen to this message in the future and say, wow, it's, man, he knew. <laughs> and, and they're so zealous about that. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the social media. 
They're zealous about that. How many selfies can you put? You look the same every time. Stop. But you have lots of zeal for that. Zeal for God. Zeal for God. Where are the Elishas with zeal for God? Next, <clears throat> where are the Elishas longing for God's power? What do you want? Give me a house that I never have to move out of. Give me a million dollars. And he says, I want a double portion of thy spirit. I want to do something for God. I want God's power upon me. No wonder the Bible says, Isaiah 44, 3, I'll pour water upon him that is thirsty, my spirit upon dry ground. Where are those who long to see God move mightily, who long to see the power of God in their life, who long to see a ministry where souls are saved and lives are changed and people are impacted and churches are planted and people are impacted and people are encouraged and people are set free from the power of sin. Where are those who long to see God move? God is still there wanting to move, but where are the Elishas who say, give me a double portion of thy spirit. I want more than you had. And by the way, he did twice as many miracles as Elijah. He got it. But he had a zeal for the power of God. He, he was an Elisha who desired to see God move. And immediately he came across on a miracle apart in the Jordan and he went out across in the Jordan. Miraculously having it parted because he had a zeal for the power of God. Where are the churches that people beg for revival and the power of God and souls to be saved and that unsaved relative to be saved and long for the power of God flow through a message and long for a spirit-filled church that impacts the world and the, and the preacher longs for the power of God that when he preaches, souls are impacted and people are, are, are transformed and the devil's beaten back and the Holy Spirit's moving in the service and gifts are being given and souls are being saved and people are being convicted of their sin and nothing's the same. Where are the Elishas who long for the power of God instead of just a nice church building and a big crowd? And where the church is people are longing for the pastor to entertain them instead of longing for the power of God to be upon the preacher so they can be transformed. Where are the Elishas longing for God's power? It used to be a day where Christians longed for the power of God. They longed for the Holy Spirit's movement. They longed for revival. They'd read about the Welsh revivals. They'd read about the first great awakening and the second great awakening. They'd read about sinners in the hands of an angry God and, and the great movings of the Spirit of God in history. And they'd say, I want that. And now they say, I want a fun service. I want cool music. I want to get home quick because lunch is cooking. Instead of saying, I want the power of God. Where are the Elishas who are bold in prayer? <clears throat> who are bold in prayer? Second Kings chapter two and verse 14. <laughs> it's kind of bold. He immediately grabs a mantle and he throws it down and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? God says, oh, angels, this guy, this guy's bold. I like it. Part the ocean, part the sea. Let's do it. I got one of those again. And you say, God doesn't want you to be bold in prayer. You don't know your Bible very well. You don't know your Bible very well. God likes big, bold prayers. He sits up there with all he has. And says, I want to do a blessing for you. I want to do great things for you. Second Kings and chapter 2. Uh, chapter, uh, I mean, sorry, go, uh, I already read that. Uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Seeing then we have a great high priest which has passed into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You can read Luke 18, you'll find the parable of the, the, the widow and the unjust judge, and you'll find God saying, I like those bold prayers. The friend at midnight who would not stop knocking until he got uh, bread for his friend, and God said, I want you to pray like that, I like that. Where are the bold prayers? Where are the bold prayers? Elisha was going to have to stand up to Naaman, the powerful general, and say, you're going to go wash in the Jordan or you will keep your leprosy. Go away. He had a bunch of soldiers with him, and Elisha didn't. 
He's going to be surrounded by an army. And, and he would, his, 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 his uh, and they'd say, you're going to come with us. And Elisha was going to say to his servant, don't worry about it. We got more with us than with them. He'd have to be bold and strong and have to be a person who invoked the power of God. See, God is flowing with us. And if we can't go very far, then God says, man, that's all the farther we got. I had all the resources in the universe and that's all the farther you took us. You need to boldly pray. You need to boldly pray. Pray with boldness. Look, until God stops us, we're going to continue to do bold works for God. We have no business doing what we do. Do you know that? Do you have a, you know across the world we have no business doing what we do. We have no business right now trying to start another church up in Alaska. We have no business starting another church we've started. We have no business doing that. But you know what? God just keeps on seeming to like it and do it, so we're not going to stop. If God one day says, all right, guys, stop. I can't do anymore. Okay. <laughs> but I just find God's ready to work. But nobody believes he can do it anymore. And everybody has to have all the resources and the plans and the organization. And I hate organizations, so I just say, Lord, Let's just do it. And, 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 and we just got to trust God. But you know what? I believe God likes that boldness. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? He's right where he's always been. He hasn't changed a bit. The problem is, where are the Elishas of the Lord God who are going to let him move and not limit the Holy One of Israel? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to preach the Bible. I pray tonight that we'd get some more Elishas. We already have you. You're not limited. You're omnipotent. But Lord, we are piddling around down here oftentimes. Lord, you've got a church across the world in many places who's not bold, who's limiting you, who's looking for convenience and ease and comfort. They don't have grit, determination, Lord. They don't have what Jesus had where he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem to die. And Lord, I pray tonight that we would remember that you used Elisha, who wouldn't leave Elijah, who was bold in his prayers and asking you to do things. And you gave a double portion. I pray we would not limit you. I pray we'd be used by you. And I pray, Lord, that individually, each one of us in our lives, we'd get back to boldness, back to trust, back to determination for you, <clears throat> back to zeal for you, back to loving you with all of our heart and be willing to leave anything for your cause. Lord, I pray we'd be willing to be servants again, whatever the cause needs. And we pray, Lord, we would get these things tonight for you. We pray in Jesus' name.